Hi, everybody. I'm Carolyn Robertson. I'm so happy to be here today. Um, I know most of you have been here all day. Hasn't it been wonderful? I've learned so much, you know, the different workshops, the different speakers. It's been really, really outstanding. So I'm here today to talk to you about art history in the classroom is what we're going to focus on. So I know all my art historians and, and art teachers who are interested in art history would certainly recognize this image. This is one of the images that I really, really enjoy showing to students of all ages, and I've taught all ages. Out of the plethora of art images across time and cultures, I have arrived at several that really seem to measure kind of our ability to see different aspects of life, you know, and different, certainly, styles of art in those images. When I ask students to describe what they see in this work by Magritte and what it has to do with art, Elementary students invariably talk about seeing clouds and how we see with our eyes. Um, they really like the wide open stare of the eye and the absence of any eyelashes. Older students often muse on the nature of seeing and being seen. I find that it has been a really good example of just sort of different levels of observation that we tend to kind of accrue, you know, as we mature as viewers of art and, and people you know, in the world who are, are living and having different experiences. So many of you may recognize this quote by Picasso, featured in the California Art Standards for Visual Arts in the brand new adoptions as of January of this year after a very considerable drought in art support and funding. Every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain one once we grow up, how to remain an artist. This is a pretty daunting task for teachers. The problem is how to nurture something that is already within us, like the quote indicates, a quality that we can certainly observe in our students, in our children, nonetheless can easily be lost to them. So just a, a little bit about my background. I currently teach in the, the master's art history program here at Azusa Pacific. I'm also well involved in the community college system too. But before that, I was an art consultant for two um, uh, com or two public school districts here in Southern California. So I've taught students all the way from kindergarten to the teachers of those students to now graduate students. So I have, uh, I feel happy, you know, to have a really broad experience, you know, with different um, age groups in, in my classroom. That being said, I should note that I had, as a, a consultant for those school districts, probably a bit more freedom in the classroom as far as the way I taught, um, maybe compared to some of you. So what I was able to do, and this was at a time when the funding was just so drastically cut in any arts program, um, I was brought in to teach dedicated lessons, either focused on an artist or a specific concept. And then I would in-service the faculty after school for lessons they could then enact with their students. So I'm sure it's, a, it's, it's different you know, than, than what you're uh, doing with your classroom. I'd like to share a little more of my personal background with you. Um, this is one that I think a lot of people can relate to. I've shared it countless times over the years with all my students, hoping that they can relate, knowing that on some level, they may not feel totally confident in their creative abilities. It involves a few key events in my life, ones that I was open to at just the right time. I was raised in a home without art. My family did not go to museums. We didn't engage in any kind of recognition of what art could look like, what it could mean. This aspect of life was just not part of my background at all. To compound this fact, ours was a strict fundamentalist home with very, very specific rules about what types of activities, what types of jobs would be considered proper. And certainly art was not one of those. <laughs> um, that all began to change for me once I went to college. As an elective, I took a drawing class, much to my parents' dismay. While my, my skill was definitely lacking, I immediately felt drawn to this activity, this observational practice, this coordination of hand and eye, this tuning in to what I was observing as best I could. I was learning a new language, a form of communication as old as our species. But most importantly, I was learning about myself. From that point on, I took every class I could. Yet, while all that excitement was newly alive in me, 
deep down, I knew I was not like all my other fellow students who seemed so completely comfortable with their creativity. My, or their originality just seemed to flow so naturally out of them. This newfound interest started me down a road that I'm still on today. The next step in this crystallization was when in my very first Western art history class, we studied the Venus of Willendorf. This small object, this image of early woman, really intrigued me. Why were some parts of her emphasized while others were minimized? Why doesn't she have a face? How was this object used? What did it mean? Once I learned that figures like this emerged all over Europe at roughly the same time, across thousands of miles, distances far too vast for even hunter-gatherers to encounter each other and spread their practices, I was stunned. What, the world, uh, what in the world made it possible for all these early humans to, first of all, make such highly symbolic and sophisticated images that packed so much meaning? And secondly, what did it mean that they had the need to express something so similar to each other, something so uh, vital to themselves? And even though the class was focused more on dates and the use of materials, once the instructor spoke about the Venus being a fertility figure, I realized that on some level that these early humans must have known, even just subconsciously, that the survival of our species depended on them. This just blew me away, <laughs> the fact that an object could hold so much meaning. So I continued from there and took every art and art history class I could manage and eventually gained advanced degrees. I studied and sought out art in person, wanting to know more about how and why we as humans have such undeniable creative potential. What the Venus of Willendorf and her companions made me realize is that we are born with it. Creativity is in our DNA. But let's go back to Picasso's idea. Here's the challenge. Even though we're born with undeniable creativity, it can lie dormant if it is not acknowledged and nurtured. I can clearly recall as a college student, and even still, that in attempting to grasp specific artistic concepts, that once I did, it seemed like veils of gauze that had obscured my vision and understanding were being lifted from my eyes. Take the concept of balance in a work of art. Understanding that an artwork can be balanced, even though it may not be symmetrical, seemed like an utter contradiction to me at first. Yet I began to understand that artists, if they're skilled with the elements of art and the principles of design, can use those aspects of the visual world to draw our attention to an area in the work and then counter that with a different type of emphasis in another. I think Diebenkorn is just a master of this. Once I witnessed the achievement of asymmetrical balance in his work, it felt like I could never go back. The artist in his work engages us with beautiful colors of land, sea, and sky, drawing our attention to sort of the structured elements up in the upper right, but then counterbalances those elements with um, the very sort of atmospheric brushwork that he uses in the uh, lower left. Being able to recognize that every color has a value a tint or a shade, a degree of light and dark, and that artists use value differences as a way of providing contrast makes a work of art increasingly more eye-catching. This was a concept first presented to me in words. I memorized definitions, but I could not see it. I had no breakthrough visual reference that made it clear to my uncultured eyes, even though the instructor provided examples. Then one day it clicked, the veil was lifted. <laughs> I experienced what value contrast meant visually. In this painting by Matisse, The Piano Lesson, if you remove the color, and this is quite a skill I think to, to look at a work of art and try to just remove the color. I'm always telling my students um, that squinting is your best friend. If you squint at something and focus in on what it is you're trying to see, usually it'll appear before you. Um, the easy way would be to take a painting to a black and white copier, right, and, and make a copy. But um, in this example, you can see that the way that Matisse used value contrast, the, the meetings of the light and dark areas, provide structure for the painting, um, but also just make the whole work so incredibly eye-catching. The visual world was not something I had much experience in exploring, so it took some time for all those veils to be lifted. Each and every time it happened, or even continues to happen, feels like a revelation, a new way of experiencing the world. 
but it wasn't just what I was able to see with my eyes, it was also in the alignment of meaning. Art has power, I was convinced. In many ways, I was like our very own students, but I was learning at a mature age what we want them to learn in their youth, how to observe, integrate, and make meaning from the physical world, and what that has to do with so many as aspects of life, even the unseen. This is the nature of visual literacy, the ability to interpret, negotiate, and make meaning from information presented in the form of an image, an extension of the meaning of the word literacy, which commonly signifies the interpretation of written or printed text. Being able to comprehend and negotiate the visual world is especially important to today's students as their and our world is becoming increasingly more visual. This is both exciting and a bit concerning, concerning since I have noticed that among young students, their writing ability has declined somewhat. I don't know if you guys have noticed that too. Um, except I would say with my APU students who are outstanding writers. <laughs> that is why I believe we must go deeper in our exploration of the visual as it reaches depths within us and not merely focus on the surface of things. Visual literacy involves becoming more mentally and morally engaged to move in order to move between words, images, and ideas. I assume I don't have to sell you on the merits of an arts education, even if you may struggle with your own comfort level about how to integrate these values into your classroom. Many of you would agree that art education is a fundamental component of the total education of every child. Art is central to human experience. For art historians, the central philosophical premise lies in the study of art as a subject and the construction of interpretations of meanings of works. To that end, historical awareness is vital. Art history is molded by the philosophy of history and aligned with anthropology and literature. It teaches us how to see things differently, through different mindsets, with understanding, and with compassion. That doing so reveals truths about what we see and ourselves. Art historians are, in many ways, makers of knowledge. As educators, we seek to nurture the full development and potential of the learner. Some of the ways the study of art history has been found to benefit our students involves increases in informed and critical thinking, creative problem solving, an ability to analyze through critical observation, reflective and comparative questioning, flexible and divergent thinking, and an ability to make deeper connections. Students then become better communicators especially in their advancement of their reading, their writing, and their speaking skills. They become more engaged in academics. They tend to possess greater empathy, experience feelings of empowerment. They tend to display mutual respect for others and become better citizens and leaders. But how do we make meaning in visual terms, and how are we to read and understand a world that is so visual? Better yet, how do we teach our, our students to do this? Those of you who already teach art history, either as a dedicated course or part of a studio class, may recognize these categories of approach that help take the study of art out of the, the darkened classroom, kind of the art in, art in the dark experience, uh, into a more integrated way of exploring material. These are essential for learning. So visual culture, an interdisciplinary approach, including contemporary art, a multicultural focus, perspectives based on gender and ethnicity, and then enduring ideas, key concepts, and essential questions. Visual culture is the study of visual images within a social context. Now, I'm sure those of you who are, are um, students of art history will recognize the source of this image, right? Um, but this would be a good example of how we would want our students to uh, be able to recognize you know, um, an important work in history and how it has been updated in our culture. So visual culture often includes manufactured products, the media, fashion, music, trends, and fads. Connections between contemporary visual culture and the past are critically important if students are to develop an understanding of the complexity of the visual world. 
Today we are bombarded with visual imagery. Attempting to understand our visual culture allows for students to gain a deeper understanding and ability to relate to the images that surround us. We should be concerned with helping to develop visually literate citizens rather than placing emphasis on who can recite dates, names, and titles. Students need to develop skills and tools that help them dissect meaning. One method is for students to study visual images within the student's own culture in order to gain understanding within the student's social context. Mining the culture for art history images that are found in popular culture, for example, in magazines, TV, movies, theater, um, ads, that would be one way to start. So let's take Fragonard's The Swing. This painting marks the height of the French Rococo in terms of the art and the fashions of the court of Versailles. It also includes and encompasses this sort of fairy tale theme, uh, the coloration, in addition to being a good indication of the social and marital practices of the French aristocracy. If you notice, there are two men in the painting. The one behind our girl in a swing with ropes attached, and you see his ropes are attached, right, to, to her swing, uh, which we presume to be her husband controlling the situation while the other gentleman is strategically placed in front, low enough to benefit from the flirtatiously tossed shoe, while a complicit statue of Cupid, totally in on the court secret, right, presses his finger to the lips. The swing expresses the values of this culture and reflects a long tradition of royals not marrying for love, but for power, for connections. So infidelities were commonplace and simply understood. This also marks a time when the royal, royals were met uh, with increasing hostility due to their lack of concern for average French citizens. Now turning to our students' world, in the enormously popular movie Frozen, the character Anna enters a portrait hall in Arendelle Castle, and there she sings for the first time in forever about her hopes and dreams of finding true love at the coronation ball. She hops on couches and imagines herself in a number of different paintings in the collection, a student of visual culture would quickly recognize this uh, artistic reference, even though the extramarital connotations are absent, right? <laughs> in this more serious reinterpretation exhibited at the Tate in London in 2001, the artist Yinka Shibonari depicts the female figure wearing signature African fabric instead of pink lace, making reference to the involvement of France in the slave trade. This time, the figure is headless, which implies the bloody history of the French Revolution, the invention of the guillotine also. In addition, he shows the lady without the two men, which make us the onlookers, the voyeurs. His work explores cultural identity, colonialism, and post-colonialism within the contemporary context of globalization and our part in that. In an interdisciplinary approach, students learn by social, constructive, investigative, and expressive methods. Art history quite naturally lends itself to addressing literature and history. Art instruction within a history class may allow students to arrive at multiple interpretations of historical events. Also, understanding art in relationship to the economic and social conditions in which it was created helps us understand what influenced the artist. Some of the elements that are essential for interdisciplinary learning through the arts include learning experiences that promote meaningful connections between the disciplines, in-depth study of the context of the disciplines. This would involve using accurate and carefully selected examples and terminology, and involvement of students in processes that are authentic to the arts. This could include creating, uh, performing, and certainly responding to the work. An integrated curriculum allows for deeper thinking as the approach is characterized by, and I think really thrives in an atmosphere of complexity, ambiguity, contradiction, paradox, and the exploration of multiple perspectives. In life, our social and personal problems do not respect the boundaries of school subjects, so it is important to consider what the work of art meant to people of the time versus people who are viewing it today. So let's take an admired style and artist as an example, Impressionism and the work of Monet. 
Many admire Monet's work as it so personally and expressively captures the beauty of nature. Impressionists were the first artists to paint the outdoors in the outdoors, and they were the first to maintain the desire to make works that were of their own time, subject matter of their own time, documenting their own time, and not merely the referencing to religious or historical themes. Since theirs was a world of rapidly changing advances in science and technology, they sought to capture the fleeting moment in their works. In this way, Impressionism was truly modern. In 1666, Sir Isaac Newton began contributing to the field of optics by observing that color is a property of light by measuring it through a prism and producing the refraction of light. So what we're seeing here on the left-hand side is the electromagnetic spectrum. So we, these are all the rays that are moving through the atmosphere. So we have invisible rays, you know, from the top, gamma rays, x-rays, microwaves, radio waves. That section toward the middle in color is the visible light spectrum, so that range of rays that's visible to us. So then Sir Isaac Newton uh, took a ray of light and through a prism was able to see this a range of color and talked about um, the, the phenomenon of color being a manifestation of light. So that was certainly uh, something that was established you know, by the Impressionist time. In the latter 19th century, however, the chemist Michel uh, Eugene Chevreul, working largely um, in the textile industry as it applied to fashion, published The Law of Simultaneous Color Contrast in one of the first systemic studies of color perception, along with principles of color relationships that were widely adopted by 19th century French painters. So in this way, the Impressionists were trying to be as up-to-date, as modern as possible in the way that they were regarding color as being a scientific area of exploration. So Chevreul's law of simultaneous contrast states that two colors placed next to each other when seen by the eye will appear as dissimilar as possible. Chevreul also developed optical mixing, the idea that colors actually mix in the eye. And even though an artist may not mix a color, say brown, you know, on the palette and apply it to a canvas, as long as you have, and I'm sure you've seen this in Impressionist works, red dots next to uh, green dots. And as you move away, it looks brown. And that's because of optical mixing, that the phenomenon is actually happening in the eye. So this is why then we think that the Impressionists painted so rapidly, is they were trying to be as scientific as possible. So the idea that if light falls on an object, revealing a point of color, they need to quickly capture that moment because the moment is fleeting. The moment will be gone in an instant. The minute that you know, the colors change, it should be a different painting. So in many ways, they were being sci as scientific as possible, but they were really racing the clock. They had a, a concept of time that I think was very new for them too. So um, yeah, so we look at his many varieties of the same subject matter. So Monet, I'm sure all of you know, would sit in front of uh, the Rouen Castle would sit in front of haystacks, had so many uh, very specific subject matter that he would rely on, all in this effort to just capture the colors, to capture the light. Contemporary art has its admirers and detractors. Many teachers are uncomfortable with contemporary art and tend to avoid it. Some are just unfamiliar with it. It's not the way that they were taught, or they're just not sure you know, how to include it but contemporary art is full of questions and challenges. When teaching current works, we don't typically have the benefit of a well-established historical perspective uh, on their place in history. I think uh, our speaker this morning was mentioning that. You know, even for contemporary art and books, it, it's art that's 40 years old. You know? Yet the value of contemporary art instruction is that it introduces students to artists that are working within their own time which allows the students to examine issues that they them, themselves might be dealing with. There are many places where contemporary art connects to traditional linear art history, allowing for new ideas to be formed and to help make, them, uh, help make meaning for both. We can use older art to teach contemporary art and vice versa. By intermixing through the entire course, 
students gain a deeper understanding of the issues artists are currently dealing with and how those issues and works relate to history and the world of ideas. In this work from the early 17th century, the artist Dehim provides a lavish display of food and other items of luxury and learning. Students typically recognize this as a still life, and they would be right. The artist of this genre began the practice of what's known as vanitas. This is a type of still life painting that flourished in the Netherlands from 1620 to 1650 that conveyed a religious message and was characterized by objects of mortality and the meaninglessness of worldly pleasures. Initially, Vanitas paintings were still lifes that were painted on the backside of portraits, but then they sort of came into their own, you know, as a dedicated uh, genre and a dedicated art form. Now, to better understand the concept of Vanitas, I often explore a 21st century work by British artist Damien Hirst that although it is not a painting, it's a sculpture, expands on the theme of Vanitas, I think. <laughs> This life-size replica of an 18th century human skull is covered with more than 8,000 diamonds and bears real human teeth. Students are immediately drawn to this image, one that speaks in a myriad of ways to different cultures. Students begin to see connections with the painted version in a fascination, fascinating exploration of the use of media, symbolism, the idea that objects can, themselves can hold so much meaning, the discussion takes on personal meaning as students relate this image to Day of the Dead traditions pr practiced by many. Multicultural education then involves seeking understanding. To seek understanding or cultural understanding is to, is to gain self-understanding and to appreciate and respect one another. A multicultural focus provides opportunities to expose students to how other cultures have evolved and responded to ideas and issues. This approach is particularly important for us because North America is a product of many different ethnic groups. Instruction can focus on a universal approach that emphasizes commonalities between groups of people, or it can involve an approach which places objects within a social context. Regarding globalization, the idea is that we all belong to one global economy and society and no one remains independent of being influenced by other cultures. Integrating uh, art from Western cultures within the typical art history curriculum can broaden students' ideas about the producers of artwork and contributions this art made to the group's culture. It is important to emphasize that all cultures had made valuable contributions to art. In exploring the principle of scale, and the expression of power that a work of such colossal size can yield, I often present this image to my students. This likeness of the Buddha, along with two others that accompanied this figure, were formed into niches along the Bamiyan Valley mountain range in Afghanistan. They were built along the Silk Road, estimated at having been made in the fifth century CE. They looked out over the Bamiyan Valley and represent a shift in Buddhist belief. Theravada Buddhism, the earliest form, held that its followers must lead a monastic life and was meant for only the most devout followers. These statues of the Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, represent Maya, Mahayana Buddhism, or a new form that allowed for Buddhism for all. It is interesting to explore the symbolism of the way these works were presented overlooking this expansive valley, looking out over to the south, almost as if they were there to announce this new concept of Buddhism. Now, you may have noticed that I used the past tense in referring to these works. That is because they no longer exist, right? On March 11, 2001, six months exactly before 9-11, these colossal statues were testaments that were testaments to a shared belief and way of life were blown up by the Taliban. After we learned this in class, so many interesting examinations with students ensue. We talk about the power and threat of belief, the destruction of cultural heritage. It really is one of the most provocative lessons you know, that I feel like I teach. This lesson takes yet another turn when I show some of the reactions to such a loss. 
This proposal by artist Hiro Yamagata included a laser installation powered by windmills and solar panels in an effort to reinsert images of the Buddha back into the mountainside uh, through much more modern technology what, in what some might even call indestructible means by light. It was never fully realized. They're actually still working on it. Um, UNESCO is getting involved in this project. Um, but it's certainly an idea that speaks to the power of thought, the power of belief, of customs and history, the undeniable power of expression. The inclusion of artists who reflect a range of ethnic, gender, and socioeconomic backgrounds is vital. The art world includes the same diversity that we see in our society, yet this diversity is not fully explored in art history. Most art history books have just a, a preponderance of white males um, who were you know, deemed to be the famous ones. So it's important that we as teachers uh, explore that further, ask students why, we, why they think that is, and certainly you know, go into uh, other genders and other ethnicities. There are many lens through which we can examine art. Feminist criticism is an approach concerned with the oppression of groups, especially women in society, but still advocates for equal social, political, and economic rights for all women and men. Issues of race, gender, ethnicity, and visual culture are all inextricably linked. It is important to understand the context of a work of art. In Shirin Neshat's series, Women of Allah, the artist is concerned with Islamic women and femininity in a region where women's rights are limited and controlled by religious law. The beautifully scripted, almost seductive nature of the elegant writing is from the Quran and passages which describe the expectations of women's behavior, their dress in particular. I recently explored this image in a class with Muslim students who had a very powerful reaction to the work, not only the wording, which they translated, but in the image of the barrel of a gun presented as an earring, a threat to any kind of ornamentation of the body as well as the vacant and saddened expression of the woman's face. Of course, they were able to see so much more in this work as they live within that context. Kara Walker is a fascinating contemporary artist who explores racism through the medium of black cut paper silhouettes of caricatures of antebellum figures arranged on a white wall in uncanny, provocative, and I think kind of disturbing scenarios. Her revival of 18th century cut paper silhouettes displayed in a cyclorama or a round room, even that is referring to an old uh, 18th century practice, um, critique historical narratives of slavery and the ongoing perpetuation of ethnic stereotypes. This one, commonly referred to as Gone, refers to Margaret Mitchell's 1936 novel Gone with the Wind, set during the American Civil War. While Walker's narratives begin and end with coupled figures, sort of a, like a plantation kind of romance idea, uh, it lands heavily with imagery which refutes the promise of romance over that of power and oppression. Walker states, the history of America is built on inequality, this foundation of racial inequality and social inequality. It is interesting to note that when her works were first widely shown in the mid-90s, she was highly criticized by her own black community. Many thought her imagery perpetuated stereotypes, that we were well past, and that her work was regressive and took people backward. It has been more than fascinating to pre present these images now in our current political climate in order to explore just how far we think we've come when it comes to racial injustice. So when it comes to incorporating these approaches into curriculum design for the arts, there are several important overarching concepts. Three of the most prominent are enduring ideas, key concepts, and essential questions. Enduring ideas represent human concerns that have been significant over time in multiple cultures and therefore encompass a vast amount of information. These link today's students with multiple periods and styles of art from the past. Key concepts allow the instructors to examine enduring ideas and explore a range of perspectives, ensuring a depth of understanding is brought forward. Key concepts might be those that are complex, ambiguous, even contradictory. 
essential questions then function to focus both the teacher and student on learning throughout instruction. This reflects a deeper level of learning other than just surface facts. Enduring ideas, as they are, they tend to be more symbolic, will remain with students far longer than certainly the memorization of dates and titles. And asking essential questions can inspire divergent over convergent thinking. Now, so far, I have geared my information around middle school to high school students. It's important that no matter the grade level, that we hold on to um, the, the uh, key concepts that we want our students to, to grasp. So what I'd like to do is give you an example of how I might present probably the world's most famous painting to different age groups. I believe that art has a language and is a language. It is important to expose students, students to art terminology that is both specific and expressive. They will find that the use of terminology in the arts will help them arrive at a more specific and precise meaning. So with very young students, when looking at Starry Night, we first talk about what they notice. Inevitably, it's the swirling sky. We explore how Van Gogh used color, line, and pattern to draw our eyes to that area. What are the lines like? Are they straight? Are they curved? Do they flow? Do the lines create shapes? What types of shapes? Then students describe the mood of the work. Is it serious? Is it funny? How can you tell? What do you think the artist was trying to say with this work? How was he feeling when he made it? For elementary students who have been older, invariably one student brings up the fact that this is the artist who cut off his own ear. Instead of avoiding that topic, I explore with them some of the struggles of Van Gogh's life. We discuss his strict upbringing, his desire, like all of us, to have close friendships, his habit of eating paint, and I tell them this is, this is documented, we know that that's something he wrote about, and the fact that he had a medical, medical condition, epilepsy. Students usually express feelings of compassion for the artist at this point. We discuss that we all have a myriad of emotions that move through us every day, and that in life, one of the biggest challenges we face is the struggle to understand our feelings. While Van Gogh was a very gifted artist, one who had very, very strong feelings, I advanced the thought that maybe, perhaps, he didn't really understand that, that turmoil uh, of feelings that he had. I actually give him the, them the image of all these swirling emotions going on inside him and how those feelings just travel down his arm, out the paintbrush, onto the canvas. So while his turmoil of emotions and maybe this lack of understanding of his own emotional life led to great works, it was one of the very things that kept him marginalized from society. We typically have a very interesting discussion about how his emotions can both be seen in this work with the use of color, line, shape, even the illusion of motion, but more importantly, how it's felt by the students. For middle school and high school students who may already have formed an opinion about why an artist would cut off his own ear, I think it is important to go into more detail of Van Gogh's life and relate it back to his artwork. In addition to the, to the above, we know that Van Gogh was named after his dead baby brother who was born on the same day as Vincent a year prior, both babies being given the name Vincent Willem Van Gogh. This is one of those bits of information that just stops students in their tracks. We explore it. How would that feel? They talk all about it. We delve into his upbringing to find that his father was a harsh fundamentalist minister and that as a result, Vincent grew up with a lot of heavy judgment. And even though he was brilliant, speaking four different languages, he never felt like he could measure up to his father's expectations. Often he would forego eating in order to save money for art supplies. We discuss his dedication to his work, but also bring up the idea that he then talked about eating paint and how that made him feel more creative. So we explore the idea that this was very dangerous, it led, or paint had lead in it at the time. And finally, his epilepsy is something that is mentioned in the research, but only in passing. I have never found it sufficiently delved into. I tell them about my own experience with my father who had epilepsy. When I was growing up, I would see my father have a seizure at least once a week. And sometimes if we were out in public, say at a, a store, um, he would, might have a seizure and 
people in the store would just drop what they were carrying, you know, and run just in terror. And that has always made me realize that, you know, even in more modern times, when we have a medical explanation for different conditions, um, back in Van Gogh's day, uh, they probably thought he was possessed by the devil, you know. So that was one of those other huge factors that I think really kept him marginalized. So with the older group, we discussed society's views on mental illness, Vincent's lack of any kind of help or resources that he might have today. Uh, as you can see, this discussion becomes quite layered. We explore how we might see all of that in this masterpiece. Another challenge for many is abstract art. Abstract art leaves many people feeling confused. I often hear, what is this artist getting at? I don't understand it. You know, what is this about? Anybody could do that, you know, <laughs> those kinds of comments. This is one area where I have to say young children just shine in their willingness and enthusiasm to describe what they see and to make connections. It is a skill that I've noticed as they mature, many leave behind. Abstract art marks a change in the way we approach a given subject or image. Following the Renaissance, when linear perspective was devised, the approach to image making always involved uh, a, like a picturesque view, one in which you had foreground information, maybe middle ground, background, and all of that aligned into kind of a, a vanishing toward or pulling backward to a vanishing point. In that sense, realistic art can be seen as convergent. Abstract artists approach things in a very different way. They tend to give us images with the hope that we will expand on them. The artists begin with shapes, colors, textures, patterns that ideally make us think of other things. The idea is to make associations that are expansive and therefore divergent. This painting by Paul Clay is one uh, that can make its point you know, quite on its own. It, it never really fails. I have shown this image to dozens of groups ranging from kindergarten students to teachers of those students. Invariably, the younger the learner, the more they gasp with excitement when I show this image. They can hardly contain themselves, while the older learners are left without words, often with just sort of confused expressions. They can't make out what they're looking at and cannot fathom what it might mean. Take, for example, the small yellow circle at the bottom left, this one right here. Young students eagerly describe this as a flower, a cut melon, maybe a cucumber, a piece of sushi. Um, the white column-like shades um, are often described as vases holding uh, spirograph flowers, clear drinking glasses after someone just finished their morning milk, uh, or the projection of searchlights at an evening car dealership sale, maybe. <laughs> Some describe the yellow shapes at the top center as the sun and the moon, while others see a hamburger. The point is the possibilities are almost endless. Each work of art is subject to many interpretations. We live in a time when that is not only possible, it is one of the foundational philosophical precepts of the world we live in, and a value that most artists welcome. I tend to teach art history with this value in mind, both in my selection and presentation of works, but most importantly in the way students are encouraged to speak about their reactions to art. We are at a point where artists invite us to add meaning. So it's no longer the case where artists are putting all of the concrete meaning, you know, all the predetermined meaning in a work of art. And I, I think in many ways they realize that it, they're putting their own expression and in many ways their own power into a work of art, but they know that we as viewers have our experiences in life. We have our power that we bring uh, to the situation. And I, I always tell my students, you know, when I was your age, when I was in your 20s, um, or even younger students, I would look at a painting and get a certain amount out of it. And then years later, I would look at the same painting and it would mean something so completely different to me. And I've, I've told them, that's, uh, what do you think about that? The painting didn't change, you know, it's still the same painting, but I did. So it's that sort of spark of recognition between the work of art and the experiences of the viewer, you know, that is so vital to us, the way, the, the possibilities that um, of the ways that art has of speaking to us. Um, let's see here. So then that brings us to assessment. Assessment is not just a test, but a process that supports and enhances student learning, and not something that merely documents what students know or can do. 
standardized tests represent the lowest levels of student learning, especially when it comes to a subject like art and art history. Instead of rote memory, assessments of deeper thinking and those that are more challenging to students in order to make connections are vital. The goal is for students to be able to think about and explain ideas found throughout the history of art and say how those ideas relate to them today. They should be able to identify themes within art that they feel are important and to be able to state and support their beliefs. They should be able to identify works of art well enough so that they can group them with a similar time period or style and be able to describe some basic characteristics of the work. It would be way more important that they be able to recognize a Greek or Roman work of art over a Renaissance or Impressionist work. Even more important is that they could say why. Decoding artwork can leave students and teachers feeling overwhelmed or what may, in what may appear to be a very exclusive body of knowledge. In that regard, the development of critical thinking skills, thorough research, and being able to justify their interpretations and the development of open-ended discussions uh, is important. We should promote a contemplative, open-ended dialogue. So then my goal as a teacher of meaning through images would be for students to recognize how and why the French revolutionary artist Jacques-Louis David made this 1801 portrait of Napoleon crossing the Alps. We would explore it from a historical perspective as an expression of power and propaganda and for its exemplary use of the elements of art and principles of design. I would be ecstatic if they made the connection to Kahendi Wiley's version by the same name with notable differences. What does this reference mean in light of Wiley's insertion of a new figure? And to bring the image to the present, the ever elusive street artist Banksy continually surprises us with his sometimes mysterious and typically socially relevant works that seem to appear out of nowhere. Last year, the artist surprised Paris Fashion Week with the appearance of seven new works. What does this recognizable, this recognizable image communicate to us now? So as teachers of art and art history, we are responsible for engaging learners with art in its many forms, ideas, and purposes as a language that, like poetry, explores how, in, a, in contrast to merely what, something is through our interaction with images. My advice is to let the changes that you see in your students happen to you along with them. Art can change them, and if you haven't already experienced this, it can change you too. After all, who doesn't want to be thought of as an open person? <laughs> I often tell my students that everything they've ever thought, felt, experienced in life, art has been made about that. But the most exciting thing to realize is that no one would make what they will make. And that includes not only works of art made by their own hands, but realizations made too. OK. That's all I have. <laughs> Would you let me look at our time and just see if we have time for, for some thoughts. We have a couple of minutes. Yeah. How many of you are art history teachers? So you are. OK. In, the, in high school, right? Is it AP, art history? Where are you? OK, awesome. And everybody else is uh, either a student or um, an art teacher that's trying to incorporate more art history into their classroom. So one of the, the greatest resources that I have found for contemporary art, and just realizing that you probably have a lot of resources right, for um, older art, but is the PBS Art 21 series. Uh, is outstanding. It has wonderful interviews with contemporary artists who are very clear in their explanations you know, of what they do. Um, art, art 21. And the artist tab has just, I, it seems like, I don't know, 100 maybe artists. It's a lot. Do you use it? Yeah, yeah it's really outstanding. So yeah. it's really good. And then every major museum certainly has wonderful resources for teachers. The Getty here in LA you know, has outstanding lesson plans and all kinds of um, helpful hints for teaching art and art history in the classroom. Those would be two of my recommendations. <laughs> any, any questions or thoughts about, or any experiences you'd like to share about your teaching in the classroom? I was an art history undergrad like 20 years ago. But so I like that, I, it sounds like you don't require the exact date. I don't. I like that. 
<laughs> I think at least maybe if you get near the century, maybe, you know, that that's what's important. With my grad students, I expect more, you know, but I would say for community college students, um, no, I, I yeah, um, or I certainly want them to know the difference between early Renaissance versus high Renaissance and late Renaissance, but not so picky as to require 1305 for Giotto. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I feel like that kind of rigidity in art history is what, I mean, it is an academic field, but it also really turns people off from making the connections that they need to make. I'm more interested in the meaning of the work and how we can talk about that with students, how we can let it affect us. I think that part is really important. Mm -hmm. Well, I like how you um, talk about finding meaning. So this is for you. Who was your favorite artist for your Oh my gosh. <laughs> so I have like 10 page list <laughs> maybe. of One of my favorite images in all, of all time is Wanderer Above the Sea of Mist by Caspar David Friedrich. Um, and I wish I had it on me, but it is, from, you know it, right? Uh, so, yeah, he's overlooking the wanderer above a sea of mist, Caspar David Friedrich. So it is um, a real example of the Romantic period, and I think that is such an important period because after the fall of the French, after the French Revolution, there's just this explosion of art movements that happen in Europe in that whole century. And it, romanticism, instead of being you know, very specific and bound by dates like Impressionism and Post-Impressionism, romanticism is more of an overarching kind of quality that you see in the literature and the music of that time period too. And it, it involved this spirit of exploration that was just so vital to everything that was going on in Europe at the time. And, but they also delved into kind of dark mystery, like this is when Poe was writing you know, a lot of his great stories and uh, Walt Whitman. You have versions of romanticism in America that were even more extreme than what were going on in Europe. So Thoreau was writing you know, some of his great works, Walt Whitman. Um, but there, yes, that's it right there. So, <laughs> well, not my all time. What's well, one of my all time? Yeah, <laughs> and it's what it represents. Yeah. Would you say? I, I said like, well, I have a favorite painting, like you know, a mud calendar or the coffee mug, <laughs> like, or wear it on a T-shirt. Wow, this is amazing. <laughs> but I have many. I have I have many. Um, Gosh, I love Kahindi Wiley. So I showed you his uh, Napoleon Crossing the Alps. He has so many works that I think are so yeah, fascinating. You're imagining yourself looking <laughs> I know, can't you? And one of my favorites, now that I've seen more work of his in person, Ai Weiwei, I think is one of the most um, prescient artists, really politically active. He's a Chinese dissident, Ai Weiwei, um, but makes such such a huge variety of work, a huge variety of media, but always with so much meaning, you know, embedded in the work. We have to teach our students art isn't about things that are pretty, you know, it's not about beauty. Art can be beautiful. I think that painting is beautiful. Yeah, oh, for sure. But, but even that had great meaning, you know, like what the Greeks were involved with in terms of um, exploring meaning in that way, or beauty in that way, so. But yeah, I have a zillion different ones. I should look at our time because I she tell yes, we have to end. So she asked me not to go over. So thank you guys very much. <laughs>